Britain's jails are overflowing. More than 87,000 prisoners are currently incarcerated within their walls. For almost all of these, the aim is rehabilitation and release. But a tiny number are deemed so dangerous and depraved that they will never be freed. This extraordinary group of 45 men and one woman includes serial killers, torturers, hired assassins and psychotic sadists. In some cases, the faces are familiar. Others are better known by the nicknames given to them by the press. But many of them you will never have heard of. This series will shine a light on the dark world of some of these killers. Tonight's program looks at two men from possibly the most devious group of all offenders, the ultra-violent sexual predator. Sexual predators, by their very nature, are difficult to catch because of the vulnerability of the victims that they prey on. He was going to tighten that belt until I died. He was going to suck all the life out of me. None of us had dealt with a case like this before. It was a blood-splattered murder scene. Serious sexual offenders don't stop. The high that they get from it is just too addictive. the time it happened, I was at my nan's, my grandmother, for the weekend. My mum went out that night and um, I was coming home. I was really excited to see my mum my and my sisters. I remember just running up the stairs and as I came to the front door, it was open. To me, it was confusing. You know, everything was everywhere. <laughs> like there'd been a commotion or something. It just, it just didn't look like my home. I was really scared. All I can remember is like, now there was like sirens and the ambulance. I knew something was wrong. Something, you know, terrible had happened. Something terrible had happened. Inside the apartment, Rodine's mother, Norma Richards, and her two sisters, Samantha and Syretta, lay dead. They had been horrifically murdered. Norma had been stabbed to death, and the two children were dead in the bath upstairs. Samantha, the oldest girl, had been stabbed and then put in the bath, and Syretta had been drowned. Norma lived in this block of flats with her partner, Keith Cunningham. His brother was this famous footballer, Laurie Cunningham, the first black player to play for England and the first British player ever to sign for Real Madrid. One weekend in mid-June, 1982, Norma was alone in the flat with her two older daughters, nine-year-old Samantha and seven-year-old Syretta, as Keith was in Madrid visiting his brother, Laurie. With her youngest daughter, four-year-old Rodine, being looked after by grandma, Norma felt like socialising. She put the children to bed on the Friday night, and it was quite late at night, about half eleven midnight, she went out with her friends to a series of nightclubs, the last being the Four Aces, which was in Hackney, which is about 500 yards away from her house. The Four Aces was a legendary London nightclub and a mecca for the city's West Indian community. Norma Richards was last seen leaving the Four Aces on her own just before five o'clock. Uh, she walked the 500 yards home where she was never seen alive again. On the Monday morning, her mother-in-law, Mavis Cunningham, arrived home with Rodine, the four-year-old daughter. 
she got in and the poor lady found Norma's body um, on the floor of the sitting room. Her dressing gown was nearby and her pants were next to her and it was clear that there'd been a violent struggle in the sitting room because furniture had been overturned. Norma's body was partially hidden by the upturned sofa and we believe the killer forced entry and then he raped and murdered her. Perhaps Samantha, a hearing noise had come down and he felt he had to kill both the children to protect himself. This was a despicable crime that shocked everyone involved. Any murder that involves three people and two children and their mother, I would say, is an exceptional amount of violence. We can't say for certain what weapon was used, but there was a bayonet on the wall, and we believe that that bayonet was responsible for the injuries. A fingerprint left at the scene suggested the killer was male. We found a palm print below where the bayonet had been on the wall, and it looked as though he'd had to lean over and either grab the bayonet from the wall or, or replace it. Forensic psychologist Kerry Danes studies killers and sex offenders and what motivates them to commit their crimes. He put both little girls in the bath and one of them may have been dead at the time but the other one was certainly drowned. It's incredibly callous. It's also incredibly calculated because it took time to run that bath and all the time that the water was running into it, he was fully prepared for what he was about to do. The fingerprint alone wasn't a great help to the police. There was a fingerprint database in existence in 1982, but it was only for people known to police already with criminal convictions. So unless you had a name of someone, you couldn't just compare it randomly to the um, database that we had. Angela Gallup is a forensic scientist. It's her job to examine contact trace material associated with crimes. These days, fingerprint comparisons are relatively straightforward, with the process being largely automated and the possibility of comparing prints across all forces and across all crime types relatively easily. But in the early 1980s, it was a very different story with the whole process dependent on a card index system and manual checking, which was much less effective and much more time consuming. Chillingly, it became clear that the killer hadn't fled the premises immediately after the murders. He got some nail varnish and um, other bits of cosmetics and scrawled NF for National Front over various walls and doors within the flat. The National Front was a far-right nationalist organisation, opposed to multiracialism and immigration, social issues that were leading the news in 1982. The murders came just months after the Brixton riots, the most significant outbreak of civil disorder in 20th century London, and tensions were running high. But with no sign of a forced entry, police quickly discounted the theory that this was a racially motivated killing. I think most people realised that it was a red herring. The police certainly believed it was a red herring, uh, and the family themselves also believed that it, it was nonsense. It wasn't a racist act at all. But it did reveal a lot about the killer. Cold, calculating, he obviously had time after he'd killed the two girls and um, Norma to go around the flat and plastering these uh, initials all over the walls and the doors. If he was shocked or horrified at what he'd just done, there's no indication of it. Because straight after the killings, his thoughts are very clearly only for himself. He's conniving and he's manipulative, even under what should be extreme stress. In my view, that was a a very cool act of a, a very violent man. Despite a massive police investigation, no suspect emerged for the triple slaying. Although three of their own had been murdered, police felt the black community wanted little to do with them, and information was scarce. The 
investigation did have its problems back in 1982. There was a certain uneasiness with the community and a, a certain level of, of, of mistrust on both sides. The crime remained unsolved for 27 years until a journalist researching a book on Laurie Cunningham read about the murders. I made an inquiry under the Freedom of Information Act for some information about the case. Little did I know, however, that that particular action had triggered a cold case review at Scotland Yard that ultimately led to the detection of the killer. A journalist's freedom of information request to the Metropolitan Police had prompted them to reopen a case that had lain dormant for 27 years. A triple homicide of a mother and two young daughters in 1982. I was writing a book about the old England footballer, Laurie Cunningham, and I got to hear about this murder. Couldn't find any facts out, however, and it was really only when I put in a freedom of information request that perhaps things started moving about this case. A cold case review was ordered. Cold case reviews are investigations into crimes, that mainly murder, that occurred many years ago. But the investigation was complete. There was no opportunities at that time to identify the persons responsible. The investigation being completed, it would have been put away and remained within the police system until such times as there was an opportunity to advance it, which mainly came through forensic advancement over the years. Rob Burke was the family liaison officer assigned to the case. As the family liaison officer, it was solely my responsibility to contact all the immediate family to inform them that uh, the investigation was to be reopened. For Rodine Cunningham, it was an unsettling event. It was shocking, overwhelming at the same time. I thought, oh gosh, it's gonna start all over again. But I was happy that it was, it was going to happen. Police re-examined the forensic evidence in the case. During a search through the exhibits, most of which had been destroyed because they were hazardous, others had degraded through age, we did find that there had been a slide taken from a vaginal swab, and on examination it appeared that that may have had semen on it. The semen gave up a DNA profile, which was checked on the national database something that wasn't possible back in 1982. The DNA database was set up in 1995 and is absolutely brilliant for checking that people really are who they say they are and also seeing whether they've got any connection with DNA profiles generated from stains at crime scenes or on victims. And that was the, the case in this particular case. The DNA database came up with a name, Wilbert Anthony Dice. Dice was well known to the police since he was about 10 or 11 years old. He'd come over from Jamaica when he was a small child, and from about the age of 10 or 11, he was getting arrested for shoplifting, minor assaults, stealing cars, and that grew to robbery, burglary, and some violence, but nothing to meet the, the level of this violence in this case. Despite a lifetime of criminality, Dice had no connection with the victim in 1982 and so had never emerged as a possible suspect. When I looked at him, I could see no reason in particular why he should have been connected with those murders. But I went back through the files and found uh, that there were some outstanding fingerprints uh, taken from the scene. This time, police were able to check the prints against thousands of fingerprint records stored electronically, and they came up with a match, Tony Dice. He was obviously in the uh, flat because his fingerprint was in there. And intercourse had obviously taken place because his semen was found on the vaginal swab that was taken from her. All those things together made him a very likely suspect. The police moved fast and Dice was quickly arrested. For almost three decades, he had drifted through a variety of casual jobs and gone through a failed and extremely violent marriage. 
His abused wife would later give evidence against him in court, and he was far from happy about being arrested. I understand you want to find the killer to this woman, but it's not me, mate. It's not me, and you're fucking up my life. He was in shock and in denial, I think is the best way to put it. He initially denied knowing Norma, denied knowing anything about it. I didn't do this, mate. I didn't do this. I didn't do it. Then eventually he admitted knowing Norma. And then finally, when we said that w what DNA we'd found, he said, yes, he had had sex with Norma. But you had sex with her? Yeah, I probably did, yeah. I'm not denying that. But he'd had sex with her in the laboratories of the Four Aces nightclub in Hackney. What night was that? Friday going into Saturday. You know, it was after midnight. I know that. We was in the ladies' toilets. It was the only thing he could have said that would have got him off being charged that, that day. So he had to be bailed, and we went um, and interviewed as many witnesses as we, as we could, and that took several months. Dice had given himself valuable time, and the police cause for concern. We were very worried that he would disappear. First, the police had to disprove Dice's claim that he had sex in the Four Aces nightclub toilets. Bearing in mind that the club no longer exists, we went back and found the owner at that time, a lot of people from, from that social circle who'd used the Four Aces nightclub and were able to give us detailed information and plans showing what exactly was where, where the loos were, where the dancing areas were, where the, the chill-out places were. And all the witnesses said that it was impossible for Norma to have had sex with Tony Dice in the loos because that's where they congregated to take drugs and she would have been seen. As the investigation continued, more crucial evidence came to light about Tony Dice and his taste for violence. Some pivotal evidence came from various members of the community who came forward to talk to us and gave evidence of his savage behaviour and violent behaviour, sexual behaviour towards them in the 80s, which they had suffered and never, never reported to police because they didn't want to, they didn't think they'd be believed. One of the women who came forward was Alison Teig. She has never spoken publicly about her ordeal before. In 1986, I lived in a small flat in Hackney with one child who was around about 18 months old. And I, I was heavily pregnant at the time as well. I was in bed one night. It must have been in the middle of the night. The door knocked. Half asleep, got to the door, saw a shadow of a man. I thought it was my partner. So I opened the door and Tony Dice was standing there. His mum lived on my estate, so I knew of him, so I uh, thought he was relatively safe. And uh, he asked if my partner was at home. I sillily said no and went to shut the door. He asked to use the toilet and I let him come in and use the toilet. And I returned back into the bedroom to my baby that was laying on the bed. And as I went to pick up my daughter, I felt a knife in my neck. It was Tony Dice, he was completely naked, and he dragged me out of the bedroom backwards. I was terrified, I was absolutely terrified. I was too scared to scream. I just thought, I want to stay alive. He pulled me back into the bathroom and he seriously sexually assaulted me. Even sex offenders tend to have a code of conduct, albeit a very distorted code of conduct, and many would balk at attacking a pregnant woman. They simply wouldn't see her as fair game. Now, we already know that Dice has got no finer feelings for children, and he's demonstrating that here again. He didn't seem right. He was mad. There was something in the eyes. He was so cold, no response, nothing. You could just look at his eyes and know he meant it.
I went through years of thinking I should have screamed, run for help. But now, looking back, I survived because of the way I dealt with that. I just complied. I know it sounds terrible, but I complied because I wanted to stay alive. I was thinking of my baby in the bedroom. I am quite convinced that if Alison hadn't complied with DICE, she wouldn't be here to tell the tale. There's no right or wrong way to respond to being the victim of rape. It's very, very common for women to freeze. They're so terrified that they can't fight back. She did what she felt that she needed to do to survive the attack, and luckily for her, it worked. I didn't go to the police at the time and go for all that because I was scared, but it did affect me in a big way, a big way. Twenty-four years after being attacked by Tony Dice, Alison read about him being arrested for the murder of Norma Richards and her two children in 1982, four years before his attack on her. When I read what he had done, I couldn't believe it. I knew he'd done that straight away because it was so similar and I just, I knew he'd done it, you know, I didn't need no convincing. Alison knew she had to speak out about her ordeal. I decided to contact the police and tell them everything that happened to me. With the new forensic evidence and vital new witness testimony, there was enough to charge Tony Dice with the triple murder 28 years earlier. I was scared about the trial, just being, being in there with him. I was um, dreading it a lot. When I saw Dice for the first time, I was angry. I was really, really angry. I was just looking at him and just saying to myself, you know, you took my family away from me. You know, what did they ever do to you? Dice seemed unfazed by what was happening. All throughout the trial, he was very vocal. He was arrogant, defensive, rude and aggressive towards the prosecution counsel, completely in denial. It got to me, it got to me a lot. You know, he's just, his posture, his body language, you know, as if to say, oh, you know, I'll be out of here like in 10 minutes, you know, it's not gonna go on for long. In fact, the trial lasted three weeks. I was nervous, thinking that, oh my gosh, if he ever walks, you know, that would be it for me. I don't think I'll be able to cope. Dice didn't walk. He was found guilty and told his crimes were so extreme that he would never be released from prison. When we got the call back and it was like guilty, I thought that's it, I can, I can finally move on now. You know, all that sadness, everything has been taken away. Tony Dice had been proven to be a sadistic sexual predator who habitually carried knives. Tony Dice is a very dangerous man. Throughout his criminal career, he has used violence. I believe his modus operandi was to prey on lone women or whose partners were away at the time. And that's exactly what he did with Norma Richards on that night. He's arrogant, he's not shown one shred of a remorse, and I'm extremely pleased that he's behind bars and he will not be released. Dice is a serial predator and he's prepared to go to the most extreme of lengths simply to meet his own twisted needs. To identify him some 28 years later and bring him to justice is, for the family, it brings maybe a little closure, one hopes. I'll never forgive him for taking away my family and what he's put me through. Dice has got what he deserved, that he won't be let out. It's going to take some time, but at least I can get my closure and get my life back. It took 27 years before Tony Dice's name emerged as a possible suspect. In another murder involving an ultra-violent sexual predator, police had the name of the likely killer within minutes of finding the victim. But once again, bringing the killer to justice would still be a far from simple task.
Paul Culshaw was every woman's nightmare. He was a vicious sexual predator who targeted and sexually attacked vulnerable females over many years. He loves the violence. That's what he loves for. He loves for the fear in people's eyes. He likes to see the fear. He likes people to be afraid of him. His offences escalated in their ferocity and ended with murder. I consider Paul Culshaw as one of the most dangerous men I've ever encountered. Twenty-three-year-old Claire Benson Jowry lived most of her life on the tough Rylands estate in Lancaster. In 2004, Lancashire police were frequent visitors here. Like any estate in any city, the majority of people who live in the Rylands estate in Lancaster are decent, law-abiding people. But in 2004, the estate was well known to the police for criminal activity, drug use and drug supply. There were a fair share of people living there who had a criminal background. There was drugs on the estate uh, at that time, and Claire was known to be a, a user of heroin. Her habit was probably 10 to 20 pounds a day. She was a lovely girl. She fell in with probably the wrong crowd, I suppose, which um, probably started a, a drug taking. Five weeks prior to her murder, Claire had moved away from the estate, but she frequently returned to see friends. It was on one of these return trips to the estate that she disappeared. She actually went missing on the 20th of June, which was a Sunday night. Um, she'd been with a friend. At 10 o'clock, Claire left the house. A friend at the house assumed that she was actually going to score some heroin and expected her to be back 10 to 15 minutes. A friend stayed up till about 1.30 in the morning. Claire hadn't returned. In fact, she was never seen alive again. It wasn't unusual, I suppose, because of a, a chaotic lifestyle for her to be missing for a day or so. But once that day it went to two days, to three days, to four days, her boyfriend contacted the police to notify us that um, she was missing. Three weeks later, there was a shocking development. Some neighbours of Paul Culshaw, uh, who lived in the flat just below him, uh, contacted the police to say that they hadn't seen Paul Culshaw for three weeks, uh, that there was a smell coming from his flat and there was a lot of fly activity look around the windows. I attended that scene and found the door to be locked, but there was a very strong smell emanating from the room. Uh, I forced the door open and was confronted by Claire's body. I've been in the police for over 27 years and you see a lot of bodies who have been subjected to violence but I must say in my career I would describe it as the worst scene that I've ever seen and it's a, a memory that I'll never forget. She was lying there in a very advanced state of decomposition. There was a lot of um, flies present in the room. Claire had lain dead for three weeks and this posed major problems for the police. The time between when somebody dies and when their body is discovered can matter a great deal in terms of what forensic evidence can be recovered from them. And obviously the longer the period of time, the more the body has an opportunity to decompose. And as part of that decomposition process, you can get um, flies and maggot infestation, which can make things very difficult. Some forensic evidence was retrieved from the body. We did find some sperm heads in the vaginal area, which was useful to show that there'd been some sexual activity with Claire around the time of her death. And that wasn't all. But what we did see was what looked like a handle of a fork around a neck area. What it was effectively was a shoelace that had been tied around the neck fairly tight. Then the fork had been inserted and the two loose ends of the lace had been wound up. It started off at 12 inches around her neck and it actually ended up at about eight and a half inches. Obviously a very large indentation around the full circumference uh, of her neck. Claire hadn't only been strangled. Also in the premises was a homemade bat. And that was sent off to the forensic science services 
we were able to ascertain it was two hairs on the bat with follicles attached. The two hairs were from Claire. When a blunt instrument such as a bat is used to strike someone over the head, then the sort of things we look for are hairs and skin tissue and blood which might have been transferred. In this case, hairs were found on the bat that had been pulled out of the scalp because they still had a bit of scalp tissue attached to them, and this indicated that the bat had been used to strike the victim on the head. Claire had clearly suffered a brutal and prolonged attack. She's been assaulted. She's had a sexual offence committed against her. And then he's, he's strangled her um, using this, this ligature around her. In my view, this was a, a particularly nasty, um, sadistic murder of uh, a young lady who really caused no harm to anyone. Culshaw's violence against Claire is far greater than needed just to overpower her. He's used a makeshift garrote. Now, garrotes have a history of being used as torture devices. And I believe that's what he did. I believe that he tortured her. I don't believe that her death would have been a slow one. I feel that he's a sexual sadist. Claire's body was found in Paul Culshaw's flat, which made him the number one suspect. We know that Claire used to use Culshaw's flat to smoke heroin. Uh, he was a cannabis user. He didn't use heroin at all. He would allow Claire and other people, particularly females, to use his flat to either inject or to, or to smoke. We know that she did have some heroin that day. She had some in the morning, and we know that she had some left. So I believe she went down there because she wouldn't um, expose a friend to the danger of smoking it in her home. She went there simply to use that heroin and then return home. Um, but, but sadly, um, that didn't happen. As police ran background checks on Culshaw, they discovered some chilling previous convictions. In 1985, in Upholland in Wigan, he attacked a 45-year-old woman in uh, our own home. At that time, he was armed with a knife and a broom handle. He uh, subjected her to a rape and attempted to rape her two more times before he left her house threatened him to return again if she contacted the police. A horrendous attack, um, and he was caught fairly soon after that and sentenced to three and a half years. Shortly after his release in 1988, Colshaw entered a woman's house in Skelmersdale, a 27-year-old lady who was living there with her two small children. There he subjected her to a very serious uh, sexual assault and tried to kill her before her uh, small child interjected and saved her life. The woman Culshaw attacked was Maureen Collins. And the night it happened, I was in bed. I heard him was downstairs and I went down. And he was standing there with a knife in his hand. And I started to scream. But the scream also went in once. And as the scream went in, I went down to the floor. Begged and begged and begged, please, 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 don't hit me. Never in my wildest dreams dreamt of what he was going to do. Maureen was subjected to a truly horrific sexual assault. But what happened after the attack was even more frightening. I just went on for such a long time, and then after that, I remember him getting dressed. And when he saw the stroke on my face, gently, gently. I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry. Grab me there. I just tried to snap my neck. He went for here, and I could taste the blood in my mouth. And he was punching me, and I was clawing at him, but I wasn't making a dent. And so he took his belt off, put it round my head, and I managed to put my mouth out and grab the belt in my mouth. So then he started tightening the belt. And he was going to tighten that belt until I died. He was going to suck all the life out of me. He so wanted me dead. He just wanted me dead. The only thing I saved my life was my son, when my son come. Culshaw fled the house, but he left behind a devastated victim. 
my life's destroyed. I don't have a life. My brain is actually now shutting down because of all the trauma. I won't take it. Apologising to a victim, even trying to comfort a victim, is actually very common amongst rapists. Rapists who want to try and make the attack somehow right. Now, I don't believe that Culshaw cared about making this attack right. I've got a far more cynical way of viewing that behaviour. I think it's simply the case that had Maureen been relaxed, it would have been more easy to snap her neck. Culshaw was arrested a month later after attempting to attack yet another woman and trying to kill her husband with a spade when he came to her assistance. He picked up the shovel and tried to cut off the husband's head. This is how evil this man is. Culshaw was sentenced to 10 years for attempted murder and indecent assault and for the attack with the spade. He served just over six years and on his release, immediately began targeting females again. He began a relationship with a vulnerable woman, which quickly turned violent. He used to actually assault her in areas of her body which wasn't uh, automatically visible, so the bruising would be hidden under clothing. It culminated in a particularly nasty attack where a fish tank was, was actually broken, and it tried to use the glass from the fish tank to actually cause injury. Dangerous man. Coleshaw had disappeared at the time Claire went missing. It was now imperative the police tracked him down. This wasn't a whodunit case. Um, what it was, was where is he? As it turned out, Coleshaw was quickly captured. Having murdered Claire, he'd fled to Cumbria. He'd been living rough for some time, but he, to feed himself, he'd been breaking into uh, a local baker's in Penrith. On the fourth or fifth occasion, uh, he'd been found there by the police and he'd been arrested. Culshaw refused to cooperate with the police. We know that Claire died through strangulation. Do you have anything to say about that? No comment. But the evidence against him was overwhelming. In the bedroom, close to Claire's head, were a pair of shoes. One of the shoes had a lace in, one of the shoes didn't. Claire had been strangled with a shoelace. Those shoes belonged to Culture. They were in his bedroom, they were his size, they were his shoes. Culture was charged with murder. In February 2005, his trial began at Preston Crown Court. It was to be a quite remarkable case and Lancashire police would make legal history in their bid to ensure his conviction. In February 2005, the trial of Paul Culshaw began at Preston Crown Court. During questioning, Culshaw had refused to cooperate. No comment. But now he launched his defence. Basically what he was saying was that Claire had come round, it allowed her to smoke some heroin, which was a norm. He'd gone off to have a bath. He was in the bath for about an hour. And when he came back from the bath, she was lying on the settee. He thought she was just resting after a fix. He decided to go out. He said to collect some cigarette ends so that he could make up a reefer to smoke some cannabis. He said when he came back in, he walked into the lounge and he saw Claire and her eyes were open, noticed she'd stopped breathing and thought she was dead. He then thought, well, with my previous convictions, if I call the police, they'll think I've killed her. So he, he did a runner. He offered no explanation at all as to why Claire was found in his bedroom in the state that she was. And uh, clearly the jury didn't believe him and I didn't believe him. Culshaw's lies continued. During his trial, he stated that someone else must have broken into his flat and killed Claire. It wasn't a plausible defence because when we entered the flat, 
the door was locked, the windows were locked and secured, and Koshar had the only set of keys that could gain access to his own room. If a key had been cut from that key of Koshar's, the lacquer from the newly cut key would leave residue in the lock. There was no lacquer found in the lock. In a legal first, Kulshaw's history of offending against women was used in evidence against him. Never before had previous convictions been allowed to be used in a criminal trial. This new legislation come in called bad character and our QC was keen to try and use this. It was new for the court, it was new for the judge, but I was happy to push the boundaries. Maureen Collins, the woman Kulshaw attempted to murder in 1988, became a vital part of the prosecution case. We traced her to uh, her home address in Merseyside and together with another officer, I visited her at her home address. I told her I was there with regards to Paul Culshaw. I really honest to God, they were going to tell me that he was coming back for me because I honestly got believed that he was coming back for me. He was coming back for me. He was going to kill me. He was going to finish the job. We were reliving old memories for her. But once we explained what happened to Claire, she was more than willing to do anything that she could do to help us. As soon as they told me, then I was doing it. It didn't matter how much it took out of me. As hard as it was, as frightening as it was, and I was terrified, I was doing that. I feel that the crucial element to our case was the previous victim that came forward. Extremely brave. To this day, I still can't believe that she did come to court. The trial was a harrowing experience for Maureen. I sobbed and sobbed. And I've looked across at Paul Andrew Culshaw. They asked me not to, but I had to. I had to see if there anything in his face that would... No, not in his face, just nothing. No, he didn't care, he didn't care what he's already did. Culshaw may have acted cool, but his case was crumbling. The trial went well. He had no defence. He was clearly responsible, but you, you could never be sure. You know, um, you, you're in the hands of a jury. When the verdict was announced, the tension in the court was palpable, completely quiet, everybody waiting for the result. Kulshaw was sentenced to life without parole. The judge told him, you are a person who is an enormous danger, chiefly to women, and whose danger lies hidden most of the time. Life must mean life. I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed like, he's never gonna hear anybody ever again. Never, ever, ever again is he gonna hear anybody. I have no doubt that um, if we hadn't caught him and he hadn't been convicted, that he would have killed again. No doubt at all. Culshaw is a deliberate and calculated rapist. He shows sadistic tendencies, which only 5% of rapists do. Culshaw actually admitted to the police that it's the violence that he likes. He likes to see people scared, he likes the fear. It's not the rape, it's not anything else he gets off on, it's actual violence. That's how he operates. That's how he gets his kicks. Rape is very, very rarely about the sexual act itself. Culshaw clearly needs to express his anger, his power, his dominance in aggression and maltreatment of his victims. And it's their anguish, it's their distress that's eroticised for him. Culshaw's a very dangerous man. It's a great relief that he's no longer able to walk the streets. Culshaw's victims at least had a semblance of justice, but the effects of his crimes are still being felt. I've got no confidence. I've got absolutely nothing. It's the fear that kills you. It really is that fear, and I am terrified of ever feeling anything like that fear again. Wilbert Anthony Dice and Paul Culshaw were evil killers 
driven to commit the ultimate crime. These men had the most dangerous of sexual addictions. But fortunately, their crimes are rare. I've dealt with many, many homicides over the last 10 years. Very few have this particular element to them. There is thankfully only a small group of men who are prepared to take the lives of others simply to fulfil their own perverse sexual desires.